associate professor at UCSD, um, and he's been there for a while. I've been following his work since grad school, where he was um, at Stanford with Yore Leskovic, um, and he pretty much did the seminal work as far as I think in recommendations and combining that with text in, in ways that, that made a lot of sense at that time. So yeah, I think he's been doing a lot of amazing work and pretty excited to have him here to talk about it. Let's welcome him. Okay, thanks so much, Samir, um, uh, for the introduction and the invitation. Can you kind of hear me in the back okay without the microphone? Yeah, great. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk today all about the work at the intersection of recommender systems and natural language processing. So since it's a fairly general audience talk, I'll kind of give some background on what recommender systems are. I'll talk about how they relate to natural language processing. Um, I'll go, sort of walk through a tutorial-like presentation of some of the most basic technical solutions to how you might build a recommender system. And then I'll talk about some recent research we've been doing that just combines the two things. Okay, so, you know, what is a recommender system? I think recommender systems are something that most of us interact with every day, even if we don't know it. This is just a simple example from Amazon. I had watched some video, um, and on the basis of what I'd watched, they recommended me these alternatives. Maybe you can, you can guess what I'd watched. I think it was, um, I don't know, Rise of the Silver Surfer or something like that. I mean, it was terrible, but I, I did watch it to the end, so as far as they know, I loved it. Um, and here's a kind of some contextual recommendations that are maybe similar to that, but helping me discover something new. Um, this is another set of recommendations, also from Amazon. So you're watching Harry Potter. Uh, it says you might also want to watch Harry Potter 2, Harry Potter 3, Harry Potter 4, Harry Potter 5, Harry Potter 6, <laughs> Harry Potter 7, Part 1, Harry Potter 7, Part 2. And, okay, that's qualitatively a little bit different. These recommendations are maybe totally obvious. They're not helping you to discover anything, but they're still kind of useful. The recommender system has figured out what you already know you want, and it's just kind of surfaced it to the most prominent part of the user interface to make the UI more usable somehow. Um, again, still from Amazon, things like um, finding relationships among content, so things that are mutually compatible or complementary or things which just go together is another task of a recommender system. Um, sort of personalizing experiences based on user feedback. This is from a, a music streaming service. Uh, it, it generates a list of songs for you. If you click thumbs up or you at least complete a song, it should give you more songs like that. If you skip a song or hit thumbs down, it should give you maybe different music. <coughs> of course, the, the advertisements that are surfaced here are also the output of a recommender system, which is presumably making some um, prediction that this product is, is somehow contextually relevant to, to this type of music or something like that. Um, okay, and maybe a very classical example of a recommender system. This one's from, from Netflix. Uh, you click on a movie and it tells you their prediction of your rating. Uh, critically, that's you know not the average rating of this movie. It's Netflix's prediction of your rating for this movie. Um, I think they've since removed this feature from the Netflix UI, but I kind of really liked it. It's like their prediction of your rating is, is maybe a little piece of extra context that will tell you whether you would like a movie or not. In this case, you know, maybe I'm just really in the mood on a Friday night for a 3.6 star film. Action movie where I don't have to think too hard or something. Um, okay, and maybe that's some very sort of... Uh, e-commerce centric applications, but you see recommender systems all over the place, at least if you think about them very broadly. So whenever we have kind of personalized interactions between users and content, things like priority inbox, can Google predict whether I would consider a particular email important? Um, personalized healthcare, can we kind of look at a individual's history of symptoms and predict what symptom they would exhibit next or what sort of course of personalized treatment that you should use? Uh, or seeing things like friend recommendation on social networks. So can I predict who you'll become friends with next? And, you know, Facebook's top recommendation is become friends with your advisor, so there's still a lot of room for improvement. <laughs> okay, so, you know, it's a very rough overview of what recommender systems broadly construed could be. So content discovery, improving user interfaces, personalizing experience, um, or maybe sort of most broadly trying to model interactions between people and content 
uh, and sort of predicting what they'll do next. Um, just to sort of finish off that introduction, I should sort of say this is a very, very uh, machine learning centric view of what a recommender system is. I'm talking about recommendation in terms of prediction. So I'm kind of imagining you have this black box which says given a particular user and some stimulus they're exposed to, will they click on it, will they purchase it, will they give it a high rating, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so when I talk about recommender systems in terms of machine learning, that's what I'm really talking about. And maybe that's kind of ignoring this, this whole other part of recommender systems research, which is about the consequences of using a recommender system a certain way. Like, should we help the user escape the filter bubble? Or should we show more diverse items? Or how can we actually make the user experience more enjoyable? Um, but today, I'm mostly talking about the machine learning part. Uh, OK, well, I have some animations that I broke. So to slightly burden you with the Venn diagram from an NSF proposal, this is kind of <laughs> the research vision that I'm presenting today. Um, what I'm talking about is work that's at the intersection of, of a couple of areas. So really, we're trying to build recommender systems that incorporate ideas from natural language processing. And more broadly, the lab res lab's research is about <laughs> combining ideas from other domains of machine learning with recommend assistance. So you can kind of imagine um, very traditional recommender systems of doing things like predicting clicks, ratings, purchases, so on and so forth. Um, there's also a lot of recommend systems that make use of structured inputs, like they might build a recommendation that's content aware, it knows about text, it knows about images, it knows about time series or social networks, but the, the prediction is still something simple. And what we're mostly trying to combine this with, which is a very hot topic in machine learning right now, is, is generative modeling. So um, this is a very exciting recent development all across machine learning. Can we build machine learning models whose outputs are actually generated images? Or machine learning models that are capable of producing or generating text? <clears throat> so that's something we might be able to combine with recommendation techniques. So can we actually build recommender systems that generate text, or which generate images, or which generate time series, and so forth? So outside of natural language processing, a few <coughs> other examples we've done of this were things like uh, workout recommendation, where we're given, say, um, a GPS trace of a route the user intends to run, and we want to predict their complete heart rate profile, and then suggest personalized workout strategies for them. That's something you can kind of only build once you have a good model of sequence generation and can personalize it for users. Um, within computer vision, we've been using this for things like outfit generation. So can we actually generate a design of an item? So using image generation techniques uh, that is personalized to an individual user. It's a nice sort of fast fashion application. And you know, I think everyone here has probably read our paper about Dance Dance Revolution step chart generation. So you know, we can generate a DDR step chart that is, is personalized to an individual user's DDR skill level. Yeah? <laughs> um, it was great, trust me. Um, but today we'll talk about just, just one angle of that research where we're trying to combine recommender systems with, with natural language processing in particular. So this seems pretty straightforward. You know, there's many recommendation settings where <laughs> there might be textual content. You might think, well, why not use reviews to improve the output of recommender systems? Reviews are explaining what people's opinions are, so we should exploit them to build better recommenders. Um, maybe things like text can also help us to make recommender systems more interpretable. Um, and looking at the problem differently, maybe techniques from recommender systems can also benefit techniques from natural language processing. So there's lots of cases where you would like to say, generate language for a user, but there's high variance among users. Users write differently, they have different subjective opinions. Uh, so if you're going to build a generative model of text or a dialogue system or something like that, maybe that's something you should account for. Okay, so that's kind of the outline. Um, so first off, I'm just gonna talk about one of the sort of standard historical solutions for a, a non-text-based recommender system, just to give you a sense of how these things work. So this is a very um, straightforward, classical view of what recommendation could look like. 
can I build, say, a machine learning algorithm that given a user and an item, learns to predict something like a star rating? Looks like a fairly familiar regression problem. Alternately, you know, I could say, given a user and an item, can I predict maybe a binary outcome of whether they would click on an advertisement or something like that? Uh, or maybe estimate any other real value quantity. Can I estimate how long a user will spend looking at a web page, um, the amount they would pay for an item or something like that? This is a very traditional notion of recommendation. In particular, we don't have any structured outputs. These are sort of standard regression or classification style scenarios. Um, okay, and you know, this is maybe a crude example for the sake of demonstration, but you can imagine if I could accurately predict people's star ratings, I could sort of trivially build a recommender system that says, among items you haven't consumed yet, find the ones you'll give the highest rating to. Okay. Uh, and that's kind of analogous to what Netflix was at least formally doing with their rating prediction algorithms. So yeah, a lot of this, this comes from sites like Netflix, so for some historical context, this sort of dates back to this 2006 prize Netflix gave out where they released, this is familiar to lots of people in this room, I know, but for those who haven't seen it before, um, they released this, this giant data set, 100 million tuple that looked just like this, a user ID, item ID, timestamp, and a rating. They said, can you solve this prediction task? Can you predict unobserved ratings as accurately as possible? So come up with some function that given a user, an item, and a timestamp, estimates the rating. It should be as close as possible to the ground truth rating in some you know, sum of squared errors sense. Um, and if you're 10% more accurate than Netflix's existing solution, you get a million bucks. Wonderful. Okay, so um, that was enough money to inspire a lot of research for this specific modality of recommendation problems, so treating recommendation as, as something like a regression technique. Um, there's, there's lots more to this story and it's very fun, but uh, let's sort of see how one of the sort of main canonical approaches to this problem actually, actually looked like. So the basic goal of, of, of many solutions to recommendations still to this day is to uncover latent relationships that exist between users and items. So we would like to do something like finding a, a vector or low dimensional representation of a user that kind of describes the different <coughs> preference dimensions that user has. Maybe how much do I like action? How much do I like romance? How much do I like comedy? And then uh, simultaneously for an item, can we say, how much does this movie exhibit action? How much does it exhibit romance? How much does it exhibit comedy? If those two vectors are pointing in the same direction, that would mean this user is compatible with this movie. Right? So that's what we'd like to uncover as our representation of users and items. Um, okay, but the data we're given, say from Netflix, looks like this. We just have this giant, partially observed matrix of users and items and most of the entries are missing because the user hasn't rated that movie, and otherwise we observe a star rating. Um, and I think this is maybe the first thing that surprises people if they haven't seen recommender systems before, is that the, the recommender system knows so little about anyone, has no idea that this person is female, or that this person is in their 30s, or that this person lives alone, or that this movie was released last year, or this one has a lot of action. It's just seeing this giant kind of anonymous <coughs> vector um, of user IDs and item IDs, and we kind of have to look for patterns of, of common variation among ratings or find people who are similar to each other based on this data. Um, I mean, that's true of the Netflix prize because that's all they gave out. They didn't release any metadata about the movies or the users, but it's also true of, of many of the state-of-the-art systems that are implemented today. They're just looking for patterns. Um, among user interactions rather than really uh, modeling explicit data about the user or the item. So, you know, I'd like to figure out that this user likes action and this user likes comedy, but I have no idea which movies are action and comedy. I just have to sort of see if there's some hidden dimensions of variance in that data. So, a common solution to this looks something like, uh, maybe you're familiar with principal component analysis or singular value decomposition. I'm just going to kind of assume this giant matrix is approximately low rank. 
um, and I can decompose it into the product of two matrices. So that would kind of look like the following. Um, I would say this is a giant, 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 but partially observed matrix. We have millions of items and millions of users. But maybe we can approximately write that as a tall matrix describing the users multiplied by a wide matrix describing the items. If we did that, we would kind of say each row of this user matrix is a low-dimensional representation of one user. Each column of the item matrix is a low-dimensional representation of, of one item. So this is a standard way of doing matrix decomposition. And if you're familiar with something like PCA or singular value decomposition, all that's going on here is that we're going to try and find what are the main sources of variation in this original matrix data. So we will find some dimensions that explain the ways that ratings vary. And probably ratings vary things like because of things like whether a movie has a high budget or not, or because a movie has a lot of action or not. Those are the things that explain variance in people's ratings. Therefore, those are the dimensions that this matrix decomposition would uncover, even though we don't explicitly know that one of these dimensions is an action or comedy or budget or anything. Okay, so that's kind of the, the matrix decomposition view of it, which I think is, is useful to those of you who've you know, got linear algebra in your heads and your hearts. Um, I know that's not everyone, so sort of another simple equivalent way of thinking about it is just to say, let's write it down as some machine learning model. I'd like to write a function, given a user and an item, outputs a real value prediction in terms of some unknown parameters that I'll fit using machine learning techniques. So I could say I have a global offset term. Maybe I have some bias terms for a user and an item, which roughly say, does this user tend to give higher or lower ratings than average? And does this item tend to receive higher or lower ratings than average? And I have some um, user item interaction terms. In other words, a vector describing each user and a vector describing each item. And that last part's the really critical part. These vectors are the ones I was talking about. They describe my preferences and they describe the items properties in some low dimensional space. So all of these things are just unknowns. You have uh, a global unknown, one unknown for each user, one unknown for each item, a vector of unknowns for each user, and a vector of unknowns for each item. And I'd just like to say, can we pick those values that make our predictions as accurate as possible? So we'll train that using sort of standard machine learning, in this case, regression techniques. Um, find the values of all of these parameters such that the model's prediction is as close as possible to the training data. Okay, so it's a regular old mean squared error. Okay, so long story short, um, the output of this algorithm is going to be a vector describing each user and a vector describing each item. We'll just be finding the sources of the most common, most common sources of variance in our rating data, and probably these will correspond to um, reasonably intuitive notions along which ratings or preferences actually vary. Okay, so that's kind of a high level overview of what's going on behind the hood in, in one of the standard models for recommendation. We're going to get low dimensional representations of users and items in terms of preferences and properties. People give high ratings to things where their low dimensional representations are similar to the low dimensional representations of the items. And really, we're just using techniques that uncover variance in data. So if you got lost anywhere there, the kind of take home from this is, is one, the recommended system knows almost nothing about who the user is or what the item is. We're just looking at these very anonymous matrices of interactions. Um, we're doing that by discovering variance. And the third thing, the main take home, is that these kinds of techniques are fundamentally based on dimensionality reduction. So. We're trying to find a low dimensional space that describes variation among users and a low dimensional space that describes variation among items. So that's kind of going to lead me into our next topic. Um, this is our first effort to try and combine um, recommender systems with models from natural language. And this is absolutely prehistoric work, <laughs> just to give you a sense of um, how, this, how this worked with kind of traditional natural language models. So we kind of had this observation that, that, look, many of the state-of-the-art recommender systems are based on 
dimensionality reduction techniques. Uh, and also, many of the state-of-the-art models of text are based on dimensionality reduction. So maybe we can try to combine the two things. And if we can do that, maybe that would allow us to better explain the, the variation of people's opinions. There'd be maybe some interpretability component. We could say what's actually going on with those latent dimensions. And secondly, maybe you could help us make recommended systems more accurate. Text is, is very useful at explaining the dimensions of people's opinions. That's kind of exactly what a review is. You're saying, why did I like or dislike something? So shouldn't we leverage that data to make recommendations more accurate? And now I've only got you know, four or five slides on this since it's old work, just to give some motivation for what got us into this problem. So in those days, this was all based on um, topic models, which is a, let's say, old-fashioned, but still very good representation of low-dimensional structure in documents. Uh, which seek to take a document or a corpus of documents and, again, find the most common patterns of variation in terms of word choices that people use. So certain words will, will co-occur together, like if it's a corpus of movie reviews, if you see one action word, you're likely to see other action words. So maybe rather than describing a document in terms of all the words it uses, we can describe the document in terms of categories of words it uses. So we can compactly represent this document by saying, look, this is an action sci-fi movie. It draws 50% from the action word distribution and 50% from the sci-fi word distribution. OK, so we kind of figured maybe there was some way of aligning these two things. Could we say, let's take these item factors that are aligned from just rating data in a recommender system and see if those could be aligned with topic models we would learn from from this, this topic model we have. Uh, and now, the challenge here is, these two models would learn different low dimensional representations. This one is looking for patterns of variance in rating data. This is looking for patterns of variance in word choices. And maybe a lot of the stuff people talk about in reviews is not really relevant to their um, preference or the recommendations we should make. If you look at a book review, people talk a lot about the plot of the book without necessarily talking so much about the aspects that make the book good or bad or really explain variations and preferences. So we wanted to come up with a version of a topic model that only discovered those dimensions that are actually aligned with um, variance in ratings. So the way we did that was to come up with sort of this, this transformation. I won't go into the maths of it. We wanted to have a single set of parameters that was simultaneously responsible for finding variation in ratings and finding variation in text. So the model is kind of constrained or it's forced to discover those topics in the text that are actually relevant to people's ratings. And you know, we did this by a sort of standard, um, well, again, maybe old fashioned uh, machine learning techniques. We just built some model which combined this uh, rating accuracy measure with sort of a corpus likelihood metric, which is comes from uh, regular old topic models. So simultaneously, the, the model we learn should be good at predicting the ratings, but should also be likely according to a topic model. <coughs> um, okay, you know, I don't have any slides about the actual results. I think it's, you know, I don't like to talk about performance in, in talks. I think it's like talking about your income or something. But needless to say, the model works just fine, or it wouldn't have been published. I think the more interesting part is sort of showing what you can, else you can actually do with this. For one, you kind of get nice interpretations of the um, different dimensions you discover. So you kind of find that if you look at beer ratings, uh, maybe not so surprising, but the topic model tells you that most of the variation exists along preference toward different categories of beer. So do you like pale ales or lambics or spice characteristics and so forth? Uh, for musical instruments, you <coughs> find you know, preferences toward different instrument types. This is a, a low dimensional picture, but you can have much, much higher dimensional topic models here. And um, you get sort of fine grained topics like there's a beginner guitar topic versus an advanced guitar topic and an electric guitar topic. Um, and you know, everything's quite nice and interpretable. Um, so yeah, old fashioned work, but that kind of summarizes what our basic idea was. So can we combine low dimensional representations that come from natural language processing with low dimensional representations that come from recommender systems? Build the joint model. If we can do that, well, maybe our representations will be better because we're leveraging more data. 
maybe they'll be more interpretable, um, and maybe they'll be more accurate as well. So following that, in the last few years, we've been trying to kind of achieve the same result, but with modern natural language processing techniques, and in particular sort of deep learning based techniques, uh, which sort of make sense because they're all based on dimensionality reduction too. So the next paper is kind of bringing that same idea a little bit more up to date um, by combining it with these new generative models of language, so LSTMs and RNNs and so forth. So this is, this is no longer prehistoric work, but it's maybe historic work. It's, it's already two years old, so it is not the most up to date generative text model, but we'll get there in a, in a few minutes. Um, so this is kind of our idea, you know, what we've built so far are these traditional recommender systems that given a user and an item predict a rating or some regression output. Could we build a recommender system whose output is actually the review itself? Seems kind of a, a neat idea, right? Uh, I think you can, you can ponder a little bit about why you'd actually want to do this, other than it being a neat parlor trick, but sort of argue why it's useful a bit later on. So this is something we figured we could maybe build because there were these very successful um, models in the last several years that can kind of be used to generate text. Um, so things like LSTMs and so forth. Uh, there have been various successful applications of these techniques to generate all kinds of text from like recipes to poetry and so forth. Um, to give a, a little hint of what's going on in the hood, um, I mean, I hardly came up with these models, of course. This is a, a very popular model from many years ago, and this isn't even my picture. But this is kind of a model that, given a token, say a word or a character, <coughs> stores some internal state um, about the, the <coughs> sentence or the document it's generating, and then outputs the next token. <coughs> so it has various components here. One sort of says, Given the last token I saw, um, how much of the internal state can I forget? Uh, how should the internal state change? How much should be preserved? And what token should be generated? So you can kind of imagine if you, if you see a space character, you can forget the context about the current word, but you have to remember the context about the sentence. If you see a full stop, you can forget the context about the sentence, but have to remember the context about the paragraph, so on and so forth. Um, this is a you know, very powerful, very effective model that, could, that trained on some corpus of text can generate other documents that look like <coughs> samples from that corpus. So we tried it out. We tried just training the thing on reviews. We were using um, beer reviews at the time, which was a very interesting domain of, of natural language data. Um, and yeah, you train on a few hundred thousand reviews and it kind of works, it generates things that look like reviews, which is great, um, but there's no personalization here. So that's kind of something we wanted to build into these natural language models. Can we actually have it write the review that you would write, rather than just writing a generic review of an item? So it should be contextually dependent on the user and the item. So this might sound similar to other work that's been done using natural language generation. So this is a very popular paper about um, image captioning. So this is called an encoded decoder recurrent neural network. We'd like to come up with a description of what's in this image. What we can do is learn some representation of the image, say using a um, CNN or something. Uh, we get a low dimensional representation of the image and we can feed that into as like the starting token into one of these generative language models, and it will generate a contextually aware description of that image. So that was kind of the first type of model we thought we would build on top of. So come up with some encoding of your user and the item, maybe just a one hot vector saying who is the user and what is the item, and then spit out a review. Okay, so how do we encode the user and the item? We sort of already know how to do that because we've been building these low dimensional representations of users and items from everything I've described previously. So kind of just glue these things together and see if it works okay. Um, so it didn't work okay, long story short. Uh, this it has the parts you feel that it should have. It is a personalized model. It's aware of the item as well. But it's 
useless to generate text even at the length of a review. So the image captions where you have maybe something possibly even shorter than a sentence, this type of model is very effective. The long sequences, it kind of forgets the input context after a few tokens, and then it just ends up gen generating generic review-like text after a while. So our first very crude solution to this was kind of just to stick our, our user and item encoding on during every step of the model. So every time you, you generate a token based on the previous character, you also just feed the model um, a representation of who is the user and what is the item so that it is forced to remember that context during every single step. Um, this, it, it did actually work, but it's, it's crude, um, but it does work. Here's a, here's a sample output. Um, this used to blow everyone's mind before natural language generation got good. Um, but this kind of worked really well, um, even with sort of very traditional, simple uh, generative models of text. This is a synthetically generated review by one user about one item. We've seen the user at training time, and we've seen the item at training time, but we've never seen the user item combination at training time. And then we're comparing that to the withheld um, ground truth review that user wrote. And it's really good. I mean, it kind of passes the Turing test of beer reviews, at least to somebody who doesn't read too many beer reviews. Uh, so, you know, what happens in, in this user's beer reviews, for instance? This user seems to always talk about the appearance, smell, taste, mouthfeel, and drinkability, and the model predicted that they would do that. It kind of predicted this paragraph level structure. Um, it predicts some sensory aspects, like it's golden orange, it leaves little lacing, those are the properties of the item. Um, so quickly dissipating white head means the same thing as white head that leaves little lacing. Um, smells heavily like kitchen cleaner. Um, this one says it's mild and inoffensive, which kitchen cleaner probably isn't, but it does predict that it's citrus at least. Little bit of wheat, hint of wheat, it's all kind of right. Um, and that was kind of uh, surprisingly good. So you can see that it, it learns relevant <coughs> context about the item, it learns the writing style of the user, like that they use this paragraph level structure, and it learns some things about the interaction between the users and the items, namely the preferences. Uh, I should say, you know, um, <coughs> if it looks too good to be true, maybe it is. Uh, the nice thing about beer reviews is that one beer review looks pretty much like another beer review. Um, this is much less effective on something like Amazon reviews of electronics products, where if you make a mistake in a technical term, that'll really jump out of you. If you use the word Samsung interchangeably with, <coughs> with iPhone, um, suddenly the generated text looks like garbage, whereas if you use lemon rather than orange in a generated beer review, maybe you don't notice so much. Uh, other than that, beer reviewers are just extremely meticulous. Like, many of them use the same structures and writing styles, and they talk about the same aspects, and they use the same vernacular. So that's something the model is capable of learning, whereas there's just way more variance in something like Amazon reviews. Um, a few more words about this paper. Well, you know, it did work, but it was extremely expensive to train, because we were feeding these very high-dimensional user item representations into the model at every step, uh, just to sort of rush through what else we did, you know, we, we tried to improve this model by making it more um, scalable, and maybe more useful as a recommender system. So the main improvements we implemented were to come up with a, a low dimensional version of this. So rather than feeding in who the user is and who the item is, we just feed in a low dimensional representation of who the user and the item is. Um, so we're kind of feeding in those representations like what we had before, just to make it more scalable. Um, the other improvement we made to this was to come up with a sort of semi-supervised um, version of this. So we can train this on a relatively small corpus of reviews to learn the language model, but a huge corpus of rating or purchase data. So we can learn the low-dimensional representations of users um, just from beers they've consumed or items they've purchased or things they've rated. And then for a small number of users, 
learn the relationship between these low dimensional representations and the text they generate. And the nice thing about <coughs> this is you could then say, for a user who has consumed items or rated items before, we can predict the kind of review that user would be likely to write. So we can kind of synthesize a good review even for a user who's never written a review before, or at least a review that's compatible with their preferences. Okay, and that allows us to train on very, very large rating corpora, um, and we can actually then use it even for users who haven't written reviews, which of course is the vast majority of users on any system like Amazon or anything like that. It's not gonna be useful if it only applies to people who've written reviews. Okay, so yeah, another example that the sort of simplified model still generates perfectly acceptable uh, synthetic reviews, but no need to spend too much time staring at the reviews or drive you mad. Uh, okay, so what's the kind of summary of, of this work? It's very similar to the previous work on combining uh, topic models with recommender systems. We're just doing the same thing now with the generative model of text. So this does improve the quality of generation in terms of sort of traditional text generation metrics that ought not to be surprising. I mean, in a, in a generative language model on data-like reviews, there is a great deal of variance due to who is the user and what is the item. So a model that can capture that variance is going to generate higher fidelity text. Makes sense. And also it's like the previous model, it's, it's useful in improving the quality of recommendations by leveraging text data in addition to just ratings. So, you know, follow-up question is, is why do you even want to do this at all? Uh, why do you want to generate reviews other than to produce volumes of review spam or something? Um, and, you know, that's a fair question. I think the, the responses to that are, well, first of all, there are lots of applications where you would like to generate personalized text outside of review generation. Review generation just happens to be one where we can easily collect high quality data sets. Um, but you, you, know, you can imagine this to be used for, for personalized models of clinical documents produced by a doctor or something like that. Uh, but even within recommender systems, this could potentially be useful. You can imagine we just have a very high fidelity model of the kind of reviews people like to write. Maybe I could use this to rank existing reviews. I could say, of the reviews that already exist on Amazon, which of those reviews would you have written or is closest to what you would have written? And surface those to you on the user interface rather than just surfacing the, the most helpful reviews, which may be totally irrelevant to your preferences. <coughs> um, you can also imagine reversing this process and using it for personalized querying. Maybe you could describe the kind of item that I want and I could find the item about which you would have written that review. So if you say, nice dress for a summer wedding, it's a subjective query, right? What do you, you consider to be appropriate for a summer wedding? Can I find the item about which you would have written that? Okay, and we also did some follow-up work along these lines. Um, some work was about trying to build like assistive writing tools so we can help you write better or more useful reviews. Maybe the, the user gives some a uh, short summary of the review, um, and we can help them expand that while preserving the sentiment and preserving their individual writing style. We also try to improve it by making it um, sort of depending on specific technical terms, so it would be better at sort of technically precise writing, so it would be more usable for things like Amazon Electronics by sort of reusing words that come from the, the metadata or the description. Um, and yeah, kind of for the rest of the talk, which is only a few minutes, I suppose, I thought I'd talk about some follow-up work where we tried to maybe um, use this same framework to make uh, more useful forms of recommendation. Uh, so this paper was about trying to use this kind of personalized language generation model to generate um, personalized justifications of the recommendations provided by a recommender system. And this was presented a couple of weeks ago in the MNLP. <coughs> Okay, so this is kind of what we'd like instead. Previously, we were saying, given a user and an item, can we generate a review? This time we're saying, given a user and an item that's already recommended, can we generate text which says, why was that item recommended to you? What kind of language or what kind of words would you write that makes it compatible with your preferences? Okay, 
so that's kind of a nice use of natural language generation in terms of making <coughs> recommender systems more interpretable or more explainable. Uh, and it's also maybe a more a practical use of this kind of natural language generation framework that actually could be deployed uh, in, a, in an online recommender system. Okay, so what are our goals here? First of all, we need to identify what are the characteristics that make a justification useful to a user. Uh, secondly, we need to try and automatically extract some big data set of justifications that we can train on. And third, we should surface those to a user in a useful way. Okay, so what did we do? We basically took some large review data sets. We, we broke those down into what's called a discourse unit, which is something a bit smaller than a sentence, so it's little blocks of text. Uh, we did some manual filtering, so we got rid of um, text that contained first and third person pronouns, which we felt were inappropriate to use as, as justifications. We filtered things that were too short and too long, nothing too elaborate. And following that, we, we basically <coughs> paid some people to annotate justifications among reviews. So that's how we started building a corpus of justifications. We figure there must be some text already in existing reviews that is useful as ground truth for justifications of recommendations. Let's just pay some people to, to annotate that. So we annotated a, a fairly small number, just a few thousand of, of sentences, and then we tried to just build a classifier that could predict which sentences are good for justifications or bad for justifications to sort of expand this to the entire review corpus that we had available to us. This is a you know, pretty simple table of results just saying that the state, we, you know, we use some state-of-the-art natural language classification model, and it was substantially better than using <coughs> classification models that are trained for things like sentiment analysis. So just finding um, sentences that have positive sentiment is not a useful source of justification. They are actually something a little bit different that our annotators are identifying. Um, so okay, these are some examples of sentences or sentence fragments that the, that the model predicts or our human annotators label could be useful as justifications. We also use some other off-the-shelf techniques to kind of break these down into different um, aspects so we can build some personalized aspect model of, of what kind of aspect dimensions each user cares about and wants to appear, wants to appear in those generated justifications. Uh, other than that, you know, we, we just fed the same data into that, basically the same sort of natural language generation framework. So, Previously, the input was a user and an item, and the output was a review. Now, the input is a, a user and a recommended item, and the output is a, a personalized justification that would be likely to appear among reviews written by that user. Uh, you know, I, again, I don't want to spend time talking about neural network architectures, but it's very similar to what I had previously, just brought more up to date with the best sort of best practice in, in natural language generation these days. So we used a, a sequence to sequence model and we use some plan and write framework and, and whatever <coughs> apparently works well today, but you know, who cares. Um, so you know, the model is fed some information about the user in terms of text they've previously written, some information about the items in terms of previous reviews of that item, uh, and it generates a personalized justification. So uh, these are a few examples of what the justifications look like. I mean, this is kind of the model I'm talking about here versus various alternatives. I think the sort of only take home here is you can't kind of do this by just, it doesn't work well if you try and do this by just ranking existing text that's already among reviews to find the most justification like text that already exists. You, you do actually need to do this using a text generation framework rather than a text retrieval framework. Um, other than that, we compared it to some different sources of data like this is baseline trained on tip data. Some websites, like I think Yelp, have what's called tips in addition to reviews. And we're just sort of showing here that a tip is, is different from a justification. Um, I think it's hard to evaluate these things, but you know, it was also useful in terms of user studies. We, we evaluated this in terms of <coughs> human annotators who had to rank the outputs of different models in terms of relativeness, informativeness, and diversity, and so forth. Um, also good quantitatively, so everyone's happy. 
uh, last thing for just one or two minutes. Another application of the same idea to kind of generate personalized recipes. So can we generate um, a recipe for something that a particular user might be likely to cook? It's very similar to review generation. Given a user and an item, uh, can we generate a review? Here we're saying, given a user and a history of all the recipes they consumed, can we generate a new recipe that that user would be likely to want to consume? So you can imagine using this for things like, um, well, just generating interesting and diverse recipes, but maybe in the future also like handling constraints. Maybe you have an allergy, or maybe you want to do some ingredient substitution, uh, or maybe you want to generate an entire menu of, of recipes that go together, even though you can't find the components of that. So this could kind of help you generate better and more personalized recipes in that sense. So again, we did some data set construction, collected some big corpus of um, recipes, which consists of ingredient lists followed by uh, sort of plain text instructions. Um, and we also have user interactions. So for some set of users, we know what set of recipes they have historically consumed. So we have their interaction histories. All right, and we just like to generate recipes that are stylistically consistent with um, a user's interaction history. Okay, so this is kind of an example of, of what a, a recipe would look like. Um, you have a name of the recipe and ingredient lists and a caloric level. Um, that's not including the actual plain text instruction, <coughs> which is the, the input to the model. So it's given the name, it's given a, at least a partial ingredient list, it's given a caloric level. We'd like to encode these things. Uh, we'd like to also encode the user's interaction history and generate a recipe based on this input. So the model is not running totally blind here. We're not just saying, give me a recipe that I would like. That turned out to be a bit too hard, I suppose. Um, maybe the future work, I guess. But we kind of imagine this sort of simpler scenario where you know a few ingredients, you have a sense of what you'd like to make. You just don't know how to make it. Um, OK, but otherwise, the model is, again, uh, very similar to the previous framework I described. Uh, a few modifications. Yeah, we have some attention mechanism and all this up-to-date stuff. Uh, but we're given an encoding of this um, partial recipe specification with its input. <coughs> and we're given an encoding of the user's interaction history in terms of previous recipes they've consumed. And then we'd like to fuse those two things together. So user representation and kind of the item representation and generate um, text output. So, okay, here are some examples of um, generated text. This is the uh, actual recipe for a pom berry teeny, or whatever that is. And, you know, this is an example of a generated recipe. So, just to remind you, it's fed in the ingredient list, the name, and the caloric level, and, you know, it says combine all ingredients in a blender and um, process to make a smooth paste. And, add vodka and blend it until smooth. It, it kind of passes as being plausible. You could make this recipe. I think cynically, all it's saying is just combine all the ingredients. Um, but it's saying it much more nicely or making it look more like a recipe. Um, OK, so you know, again, we evaluate this in terms of quantitative <laughs> metrics. The main take home, again, is that personalization helps. If I'm trying to generate a recipe, uh, it helps to know which user's recipe am I likely to generate or which, which user is likely to interact with this recipe uh, because there's substantial variation in <coughs> recipe choice as a function of user preference. It's something I think shows up a lot in natural language and you can build a lot of models out of it. Okay, so that's about it. I've almost kept within time. So to summarize, there's lots and lots of settings where personalization ought to improve natural language models. There are many cases where text exhibits variance because of users. And all my thesis here really is, is to say that you should try to model that variance. You should build a model of the user when you are generating text. So we showed examples in terms of recommendation, uh, in terms of making recommendations more interpretable, and in terms of generating text. Um, but you can imagine all kinds of other settings um, where you would like to uncover variation in text among users to build better models, things like question answering, especially when questions are subjective, is something we've been working on a lot. 
Uh, also dialogue systems, they ought to be more empathetic by maybe <coughs> responding to the user using the same linguistic style that that user um, uses. Uh, and like I said, there's all kinds of other applications outside of just NLP where we ought to be modeling variation among individuals to make better predictions or generation. Okay, so I think I have a few minutes for questions, so thanks everyone. trivial model and a model that actually makes good recommendations might just be a few percent. Uh, but that's, you know, I'm kind of defending myself for not talking about results in some way. Uh, before the next question, just to let people know the password for today is cool, C-O-O-L, all lowercase. For, for people with that. Um, any other questions? Okay, so I have one. Um, I guess over the three or four parts that you talked about, you started with something that was pretty interpretable. Uh, and then, especially when you're generating these things, it's very difficult to know why a specific token appeared yeah, in sure. an interview. Have you thought about what interpretability would look like in that setting? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say how you would quantitatively measure something like interpretability. I think often the way you make this style of work more defensible is marrying a quantitative output, like producing better recommendations in terms of hit rate or MSE or something, with a very qualitative statement about the model being interpretable. Like, let's just do a user study to say who prefers which generated text. Um, I think we can get away with that kind of because we do have good quantitative evaluations that, yeah, really, um, in a reliable way, evaluating whether one model is more interpretable than another, I don't think I have a good solution at all. <coughs> so maybe one question, um, you know, when you have generative models of text, it's sometimes, as you also said, very hard to condition them, them on something, right? Because the, the input might get ignored. Yeah. Is there like a, a simple answer uh, of how to fix this, uh, like a kind of an architecture that works well? Yeah, I mean, the, the basic architecture we used or we came up with, we called it just a, a generative concatenated model. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the original solution I said was a very trivial solution where we just um, reproduce the user representation for every single, along with every single token. Mm -hmm. So whereas you would normally have, you know, a 27-dimensional character level model, we might have a 27 plus the dimensionality of the user representation, plus the dimensionality of the item representation model. Um, but if we can combine that with a good low dimensional representation of the user and the item, it doesn't add too much complexity. But that's, that's all we've been using. We've been using just this framework that just repeatedly just shoves the context during every single step. So every single time stamp, the context is squeezed into the model. And that has worked pretty well for us so far. 
Yeah. Uh, you guys use Spurt, right? So. Oh, uh, sometimes. Okay. Not so for most of this, no. But. Okay. Because the contact window of Bert is kind of, I mean, it's technically fixed, but if you use a, a newer model architecture like Excel Map, you have stuff like in the hidden states that allow for a more comprehensive thing of um, yeah, sure. a longer review. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I think maybe longer and more coherent natural language generation is maybe more familiar to people with mm. these more modern architectures. I think with traditional LSTMs, it was hard to achieve, and this is kind of what we did with the technology available at the time, but possibly this is, is less necessary these days. Any other questions or comments? In your opinion, why do you think Watson Chef did not work and it failed? Good, I don't, I don't know, I'm afraid. I, it was a strategy question. I'm not really familiar with Watson Chef. Got it. Uh, I would not trust IBM to generate <laughs> recipes for me, I suppose, but um, no, I haven't, haven't heard of it. <coughs> Maybe that's why I failed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's thank um, Julian again.